In a vast wasteland of entertainment where radio has become obsolete, stands an embittered man teetering at the edge of sanity. With help from radio friends, he's about to embark on a global mission that would change the course of history as we know it. Broadcasting live from the secret studios on the banks of the Brandywine River in Delaware is Mitchell K.C. Hill. And up to the Great White North in Vancouver is Alexander Knight. Episode 5, we made it this far. And I was told, uh, I think by Alexander, that when you get to 13, it's like five seasons of a TV show. It means that you've made it and uh, you're going to continue to be a legitimate show. But this is version five of The Last Angry DJ. And I'm really excited today because my very good friend from way back when and today is here with us today. Uh, none other than uh, Craig Shoemaker. Craig, uh, take a bow. Say hi to everybody. Uh, I, you were one of the first shows that ever had me on as a new comedian. Did I have you on in the sense that I was having you on, or no? You didn't. Yeah, you weren't having me on. You had me on your show with uh, all due respect and uh, launched my career, Mitch Hill. Wow, That's what you're you, giving, you were known as Mitch Hill back then. There was no Mitchell. Now that we're mature, I'm not Gregory, by the way. I'm still just Craig. Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we want to, uh, as always, uh, welcome our producer uh, Alexander Knight. Uh, Alexander, good to have you here as always, uh, representing. Uh, the millennials and the younger folks there uh, as a counterpoint to my boomer madness. <laughs> How's it going, Mitch? I am so excited for this episode. I, I love it when we get on comedians because um, I'm just a huge fan in general of, of comedy. I've been to so many comedy shows in my lifetime. So we're so we're so pleased to have you here, Craig. Thanks for being on. Thank you. It's my pleasure. There should be more comedy out there, so be more like you, because a lot of times in this generation, for some reason, the comedians are the first to go. We're the first attacked because I believe it's because we tell the truth and people are offended by the truth. The truth is a fiend to a lot of people. And we are, we're Toto at the Wizard of Oz. Do you know that movie? Toto, he pulls the curtain and that's oh, what yeah, we from the and, and exposes the guy behind exposes the curtain. Exposes the guy behind the curtain. That's what we do all day long. And the frauds, they have all the money, so they're going to come after us, and they're going to have other people do their work for them and come after us as well. And, well, we, uh, we're children of of uh, a older age. You're probably uh, right around my age, and, of course, you're much better preserved than I am, so congratulations. <laughs> you made the genetic lottery, Craig. But the point the point I'm making is that when we were brought up, it was okay to point, you know, point at somebody and say, hey, look, they're kind of overweight or, or do something and ha, ha, ha. Today, the difference is that the person you might be pointing at isn't overweight, but they're upset on behalf of the other person who just got made fun of. And that behalf thing is what throws me. And Alex, explain to me, what does it mean when you're woke? What is the, the technical reason for woke? Because it's the bane of my existence right. and maybe the bane of, uh, you know, for Craig's uh, existence too. I don't know what the official definition, I'm sure there is an official definition, but I'll tell you what I see, what, I, what I've observed over the last, uh, I would say, five, six years is that there's been an increase in, in the type of people that are upset on behalf of an entire demographic and they're usually not representing that group of people, let's say. Uh, so that's something that I that I see. Uh, and of course, I'll I will um, I'll say the internet mob is lumped in there too with quote unquote wokeness um, as well. Uh, so it's I I I'm hoping that we're going to have a course correction because I feel that a lot of people have gone so far extreme in one direction. I feel like we kind of need to we need to have a little bit more balance in how we we are issues. actually. We are in the midst of it. I, I came up with a, a T-shirt and mugs, and it's unwoke AF. I tell people it's, you can figure out what AF is, but uh, Mitch, you might not know. You might be too old to know. That I, I do AF not is. know what AF is. I Seriously. Oh, my God. I noticed your face. I mean, uh, I like, Alexander, you know what it means, right, AF? Uh, yes, but I, I, don't, I don't know if we can. We try to keep this show fairly, reasonably clean here. Well, here. okay. Woke as... F right, and I I like to say um, <laughs> woke Air Force, unwoke Air Force. That's what I am. Got I'm it. In the unwoke Air Force, and what I think happens is people are virtue signalers. They can't look at themselves. We have a very unaccountable society right now. People do not look within for their answers. 
So they project it onto someone else, their own anger, their own racism, their own sexism, their own phobes, all the phobes and ists and everything they want to label you. Just label it to yourself. You're not going to choose who's marginalized for me and, and say that I'm not woke. That's arrogant. And then to me, you're the one who's not awake because you're not seeing the whole thing as it is. And that you're not seeing yourself as it is. And that's the most important thing that people do not understand. When you start going after people, you know, I could say that somebody says, oh, you're unwoke because of this. I said, what about the Native Americans? What if that's my cause? And if you, if you say the word how, you're being racist. <laughs> uh, whatever it is. I mean, I, by the way, I do think they're the most marginalized. The most, uh, uh, most destruction was done to the Native Americans. But it's like, whoa, whoa, put that one away because that's not our hashtag today. That, yeah. that's, not, that's not trending. You can't have woke... You can't have trending topics and just, they, and by the way, they never do anything about these things. There's always hashtag this and hashtag that. That's all they're doing is a hashtag. There's nothing, there's no racist that's going, you know, I was about to lynch somebody here, but then I saw this hashtag. It's a black lives matter. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to do that anymore. That hashtag changed my soul. <laughs> never, <laughs> ever. So so, does this, so the, does, the thing does it, it work is, is like that? that? That the woke society, and I don't want to sit here and, and blast woke too much, but it does it does affect your business. I mean, you're a stand-up comedian. You're out there. You're putting it out there in front of folks, and uh, you have to be at least a little bit concerned with it. I mean, you go to different cities. You meet different anymore. people. I'm not anymore. And by the way, it's swinging the other way. People are just going. Because here's the thing that's going to happen. And this is what I know as being a comedian. We're very, we are the most, I don't want to say the most woke. We're the most aware because we don't have a mob. We don't have a mob. All we listen to is ourselves, our own meter, our own souls. And that's what comes out. And it's just truth that comes out. And if people are offended by it, then it's your own projection. You have no reason to be offended by it. And if you are offended, why take us down? Why not just pull us aside and say, here's how that's offensive. I'll give you an example. I used to use a word that I didn't know. Well, I could tell you the word because in our generation, if you blew a tranny, it wasn't in an alley. <laughs> I but, used to but, but, but now somebody could freak out that I said that word, but my intention is, is absolutely my definition of that word. Even when we were growing up, the word gay, it was like the gay 90s. It means you're happy and gay, and suddenly that changed. And same with queer. We used to play smear the queer. That's a fact that I. Or you could be mad at me because I could say we played a game called smear the queer. It's not like I'm saying anything against gay people. I'm saying that's the game we played, and I'll tell you all about how the game was played. We played a lot of stupid games, buck, buck. Uh, ass ball, or if you lost in wall ball, you, you lined up your ass so it was facing and they would throw the ball as hard as they could, put welts on your ass. Yeah, these are the stories from our past. And you can't deny it, like tearing down statues. You know what's going to be next? The pyramids were built by slaves. What if that becomes a hashtag? Exactly. Hashtag, take them down, <laughs> the hashtag. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. You could come up with one after the other after the other. But all it is is deflecting away from our own transformation, our own personal growth. How can you grow? And mostly, how can you have more fun and stop this insanity? It's nuts. But here's what's happening. The world knows it's not authentic. Now, Hollywood's got the mandate now, diversity mandate, right? Now, of course it should happen. Of course we should have equality. Of course. We all know that. But don't make it false. Don't, it's anachronistic things. I, I, my kids laugh because I see a commercial. These are people that would, this is how it's inauthentic. They would never be in the same room. I go, all right, let's call in the Asian trans. Well, oh, there you go. Here's a lesbian couple. And they just do it because that's the mandate. It's not like it's true. These people do not exist at a party. That that doesn't happen in real life. And everyone knows this. They and know the true, this. The so true gonna, irony gonna, of all shift. this. It's going to shift sorry, back. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. The true irony of all of this is it gets in the way of your mission, which is to make people laugh. It's like, why does this have to stand in front of the reality of is that people come to a stand-up uh, gig and they want to they want to be entertained. They want to have some fun. They want a moment where they can put all that other stuff aside and enjoy themselves for a moment. But sometimes uh, uh, folks tend to. I don't want it to be a total uh, woke uh, bashing here, so to speak. But why it not? Why not? It should be bashed. It should be. It should be <laughs> abolished. 
There's no, there's no purpose to the wokeness. There's no purpose. By the way, it's shifted definitions anyway. It used to be a wonderful definition for blacks. And now it's, now it's been commandeered by the people who are virtue signalers. So, yeah, they should go away. They're inauthentic. They should go away. There is no tribe, by the way. There's no leaders of this group. So you can take them down all you want because it's, a, it's, it's like, you know, I was say, saying the other day to Kira, my friend Kira Sultanovich, the comedian, I said, you know what a lot of this stuff is? You know, if you're an alcoholic, right, you, you, it's self-identified what your issues are. It's self-identified. You call yourself that. But it's anonymous. You're, so why don't you just be anonymous about this stuff? We all have to buy into, you have a new term. Of, somebody's talking about her kid the other day, and she, can, she says they go to this school and they go to, I said, oh, you have twins? <laughs> no, because that's what I'm, so, and because we're slow learners, we don't learn the language so fast. When I was growing up, you know what goat meant? It meant the worst player, the guy that dropped the ball, not the greatest player, just to change definitions. But I'm not ignorant because that's the definition I grew up with. Same with queer, same with gay, same with uh, tranny. All these things, if you blew a tranny, it was a car problem. And <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. And there's so many, they, they, but people are like, oh, you got to keep up. You got to keep up. And if you don't, you're an ist or a phobe, and that's where they're being morons and taking down people who are wise. They have a lot of wisdom. We have a lot of gained wisdom that people could learn from. And what, what is it about stuff that you did in the past that in the context of the time of, or the place that you did it is now scrutinized with today's consideration and context? So you, you're, you're screwed no matter what you do because you used something or you did blackface in a, a sideshow uh, in college where it was totally innocent. It wasn't really making fun of anybody, but yet the context of the time allowed that to happen, but it does not happen today. And you get canceled or you get uh, woke bashed because of, because you participated. It's so hard. I get yelled at the other day for using the term lazy Susan. I was describing something you used at a Thanksgiving dinner, and apparently some Susan out there feels that I was calling her out, telling her she's lazy. As, Susan, will you please pass me the, you know, the gravy? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's what it was strange. called. It's what it was called. It, you know, it's just there's master bedroom you can't say anymore. I mean, it's all of these. Oh no, yeah, I just thought no. about it. No, you can't. See, I'm trying say to channel that. wokeness. Yeah, but so you can't. The, the lesson is changing. people are too sensitive overall. Like I see this all the time. Exactly. And I don't know how you feel about this, Craig, but it really bothers me when people uh, get in serious trouble for some stupid comment they made on social media 15 years ago. You know, Mitch yeah. and I have been talking about this. Are you the same person you were 20 years ago? No, nobody is. We all learn. We all oh. grow. We all mature. So why are we being held accountable for something we said two decades ago? I don't understand that. I don't think that's reasonable at all. And by the way, you can't erase history. History, you learn from history. If right. you choose to learn from history. But that's what's going on with the tearing down of statues. And, you know, these statues, they have no way to, even the people who put them up, have no way to defend themselves. Suddenly says, someone says, no, that's inappropriate. Guess what? If you see the statue and it's a racist, you learn from that because this existed and still exists. And that's how you learn. You don't learn from ignoring something or running from it avoiding, canceling. You do not learn a single thing. Do you think that Kevin Hart learned something because he put something years ago on the internet and then he was canceled from hosting the Oscars? Did he really learn from that? No, of course not. He's Anybody that's canceled isn't necessarily learning something. That's not how you do it. You pull them aside like someone did with me with a certain word that I was using. They said, hey, uh, this is, by the way, I, I was, uh, I, someone the other day, I, I, I posted something and our intention as a comedian is to first of all, be self-deprecating and make you laugh. That's the intention. So that's the thing that people don't understand. It's your intention. If your intention is to be racist, your intention is to be prejudiced or something or some phobe or whatever it is, and you're here to hurt somebody. Yeah. We'll be on to that. We know that, but that's not the intention of a comedian. We're here to make, I, so I posted something that I, that on a dating app, this woman says uh, that she's not working. I said, are, are you officially retired, right? And it came out, and I texted this, are you officially R word? I have to use the R word now, like we don't know what it is. And it, instead of retired, it was, <laughs> are you officially <laughs> slow, right? Rosie O'Donnell, my old friend, freaks out, take that down. 
in the meantime, I text her. I go, you know what? And I, I did not take that laying down. I go, you know, Rosie, that censorship is exactly what's wrong with society. And the left is doing it. You know, and I was always a big lefty. And I left the left this year because I'm done with this intolerance. I was there because it was intolerant. It was the tolerant group. Not tolerant anymore. Angry. It's projected anger. This is, she's such an angry person. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, chill it out. I was making fun of myself that that's what I wrote. This has nothing to do with your daughter. Everything makes it personal and all this kind of stuff. And by the way, she wrote the word when she texted me. She wrote the word out. <laughs> so there it was. So you're violating your own thing. And that's the whole thing when you project. You're violating your own you, you know deep down. And no one looks deep down anymore. They look to someone else to fix them. And it's not going to happen. And that's what comedians are here to do. We're here to say, look inside of yourself. Laugh at yourself. Take laughter seriously, not this. And by the way, you know who should be, people should go after? People that cause damage. How about people that put toxins in our food? All the allergies that are out there. These allergies are man-made. Those are the ones you should go after. But they yeah. have so much money that, that those people with the money, they're going, oh, no, no, let's make sure that they attack the comedians and call things conspiracy theories and make sure that they're considered wax and all that kind of stuff. Because we have no money to support us. You know, there's no comedy union. There's nothing that supports us. <laughs> there, there, there's, these guys have tons of money to, to put out the propaganda that shifts our heads that people end up working for them and going after someone for something ridiculous. And Craig, how so you there's have a lot of blowback, though. Bud Light was blowback. You're going to see yeah. tons of blowback. Watch what happens. Yeah, absolutely. Watch what happens when, when people start literally, what the, the irony is when Steve, people start waking up to this false narrative that's going on, this BS. It's absolutely, you watch what's, it's already shifting, and believe me. I say this stuff on stage, I can say anything I want now because people have a thirst for it. They're tired of this sensitive crap. We have to watch every word you say, all the censorship. We're supposed to have free speech. There's another violation that's going on. So you, you who's supposed to be, you know, liberal thinking and all that, you're violating an amendment. You're saying you can't have free speech. You can't say those words. You can't say those things. You can say these things because we say you can. Us, our little illusion of a group. You, you have can you say seen, that. Have you seen the uh, Jerry Seinfeld uh, response to, to a question who's asking the very oh, yeah. thing we're talking about? It was excellent. How do you feel about it. that? Because he, he just said, ah, do we have to? So we're going here, aren't we? Well, yeah. here's how I feel about it. And he, he put it out there. He did put it out there. He also stopped doing colleges because they came down on him. He made like a cotillion joke that was homophobic or whatever they want to label it. It's just projection. They're not, it's not true. It's just, it, and this is what people do. So Look, it's, it, it's, unfortunately it's, it's human nature. This is the direction we've taken. We have no discipline anymore because we stopped, the parents stopped disciplining. So now everybody's off on their own. Let's, let's just choose. You know, the only identity problem I had growing up was I'm a little teapot, short and stout. But I didn't actually <laughs> think I was a teapot. There was at no point where I said, please call me a teapot because I've sung this song a thousand times. I'm not a teapot. Now, you with know, the you identity know what was great thing about, about when we were kids that uh, we would we would go out after dinner because there was no Internet and uh, we would do stuff. And yeah. some of it was very, if our parents only knew half the stuff we did, but we that was arsonists. what everybody did. We, we were arsonists. And, <laughs> how many yeah, fires we, did we you set? <laughs> too crazy stuff. I set so many fires. These kids wouldn't learn how to, they, they couldn't do a match. It'd have to be a digital. Siri, light a match. <laughs> I mean, it's, it wouldn't know how to light a match. Now, I might say it's a good thing that I burnt down some woods uh, or I set some bad fires, but, but still, you, you, but I learned, I learned things. Right. You learn by getting literally burned, or you learn by by something happening, consequences that happen that are natural. Not this; uh, it's unnatural. When so, what do you what do you bring you like to that. your performances from the mean streets of Philadelphia, where you were uh, <laughs> brought up? What have oh, you learned from that experience? That uh, I, I love, you're an LA love, guy. I, well, I'm an LA guy, but I'm I'm Philadelphia. I'm stuck between Namaste and Kiss My Ass. That's kind of like <laughs> the, that's kind of like the. the the realm that I live in. I, 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 a lot of kiss my ass, but still look, I am a spiritual seeker. I'm a good guy. So anybody that projects anything onto me, no, that's your problem. I'm a good guy. Just ask me what I ask me, what my intention was, ask me what my agenda was. And you're not going to hear anything about, 
Oh, I wanted to take someone down. I wanted to punch down. They call it punching down. No, that's not the intention. The intention is mostly make fun of me trying to learn, trying right. to, you know, right. failing and falling. That's what people are not understanding is that's what we're, we comedians. That's exactly what we're doing. When I posted that thing, I wasn't saying something about our people. <laughs> I can't even say it, which is so stupid. It's stupid. You know the word that I'm talking about. It rhymes. It rhymes with farted. <laughs> And crazy, you say even and that. Crazy. What do you think about, uh, you know, I, I very much look at, I sort of hold comedians and musicians sort of on a similar playing field because I, I consider both musicians and comedians artists. And why is it that you think that uh, comedians are taken to task more for things that they say, but when musicians get political, when they talk about, without even naming names, if they're pissed off about something, they will say it in their lyrics, but you don't see people taking them to task and going on Twitter and getting really upset. So why is it that comedians are always on the front line? That's what I was trying to say is we have no protection. They have music, uh, music business is very strong. They have support. Comedians have no support and people, it's like picking on someone who's weak. Comedians don't have that support. Plus, a lot of them are stupid and knock each other. They'll knock each other out like Rosie did with me the other day. I think she's blocking me now. It's like, oh, that was a great conversation we had. You tell me to take this thing down, which I did, and then that was it. And now, and we're friends since we were kids. You know, this is the way, this is why I left the left. The left has, has a tendency to be completely intolerant and take people out whoo, like that. Like, it's so simple for them to do that. One rumor, and they're out. Musicians aren't that way. Now, here's the other thing, how the, uh, the hypocrisy of musicians, what they do get away with. By the way, you're seeing now P. Diddy and R. Kelly. You're seeing these musicians are, these aren't comedians. Comedians, poor Louis C.K., he was out because he masturbated a couple times. You know, these people are doing, they're literal predators. But people, Michael Jackson. I remember when Michael Jackson, everyone was protecting Michael Jackson. I said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's my age. Imagine I called you up and I said, hey, uh, you mind if your, uh, your son sleeps over? No, no, not your daughter. No, no, not interested in her. But yeah, and, and nobody else. Nobody else is going to have some Jesus juice. And Imagine if I said to you, can your child sleep over my house? Well, Just tell me the, that's what, the, what your reaction That's be. the parents' fault, right? I mean, who? But, uh, what right I'm mind, saying is, right. is uh, musicians have much more power to do something like that than a comedian has. You know, it's interesting about musicians and, and their positions. Obviously, uh, Michael had a huge uh, 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 collection of music that he uh, created and did so very well. But Boy, after all the other stuff that was going on, a lot of people uh, uh, you know, boycotted the music, too. And I always felt that it was two different things. The music is one thing, but his personality and what he did, right or wrong, is something else entirely. Does that mean you can't enjoy the music that was done? because of something else that they did, and then it becomes it's, it's a political a, issue? It's a sad irony, and, and I, I watched a special with him the other day. This was a pro special, but I've also watched, you know, the, the victims. And by the way, I was a victim of a kidnapping and, by a serial pedophile, so I'm very, very sensitive to this topic. And I'm watching people. That's why I say, look at your insanity there, that you're kind of like in this this big denial that he could have done these things, just that alone that you know that he did that, he had people over for sleepovers, that's insane if you back up. But because it's him, people do this, they paint red flags green, but that's it. They do that, but they don't do that with comics. It's an immediate assassination. Just, just that's it. You're done. And, and it's, it's amazing. How about the lyrics, by the way? Are, are some of these songs like if i said the word i'll say the word bitch right if i say that there's songs to the entire the entire thing is misogynistic but here i'm going to say something i've never said in my life here's the racism that goes on with white people white people are afraid to go against a, a hip-hop artist who are saying the worst things you could possibly say about degrading women and so forth Never would they approach them and put hashtags on them or cancel them. Have you ever seen that happen? Literally, you could go down the lyrics of almost any rapper, any hip-hop star, and almost all of them have to do with objectifying women, misogyny, and so forth. But if a comedian said one little hint of something, I've been, I've been chastised for using the word bitch, and it wasn't even in a mean way. It wasn't in a mean way. I, I did a joke uh, 
I was looking across this room and I was sitting, I was sitting on my bar stool. I look across the room and she, this girl looks at me. I go, I think she's looking at me. And I look back at her and yeah, she was looking at me. I winked at her. She winked at me. I go, wow. And I get up to talk to her. The, the bitch took my seat. So anyway, <laughs> so but, but how, I love, for example, how does the, in, how does in that, the, in that context, does a character, it's a how cool does a character word. like the love master who was uh, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, characters you yeah. had going yeah. way back. How does he remain to be uh, 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 consistent yeah. with uh, today's People love it more uh, than ever. They love it more than ever. He's so playing, it's okay if it was something that was done playing, well, decades not, ago. It doesn't matter. He's playing it. I'm playing a character of a guy that's like that. And that's the thing that people have this, like, no, you can't do that. I'd love it when people go, you can't do that. You can't say that. You, well, who's, who's, who's the judge of what you could say, what you do? It makes no sense to me that the, the, the racism of white people is incredible to me. The double standards. Like, if I do an impression, I can't do an impression of a black man because I'm not black. Makes no sense. I'm doing an impression. It's impression. You could do. I can impression of a polar bear. That's okay. I can do impression of anything, but don't do a black man. But I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do my Morgan Freeman for you. Right? Ready? You ready? It's do it. From, you're, Alexander, have you ever seen Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. All right. Close your eyes. Here we go. This is Morgan Freeman. In 1966, I am the Dufresne. Left Shawshank Prison. All I found was a set of murder prison clothes, an old rock hammer. And it won down to the nub and in the frame. Excellent. Excellent. That was, Give him a big I, hand. I, I, I can do my other impression. A white good. guy won't, uh, people won't have a problem. Liam Neeson. I have a very special set of skills, skills I've acquired over a long career, skills that help me deal with people like you. If you let my daughter go, I will not look for you. I will not find you. But if you don't, I will find you and I will kill you. Okay. White man can do that. Can't do Morgan Freeman. Makes sense. Makes sense. Both are full, same intention, make you laugh, make you say, wow, that's a really good dead-on impression or whatever it is. Okay if it's a white guy, not okay if it's a black guy. Who makes these standards? I don't know. So do you guys, I want to say you guys, I mean comedians in general, do you have like a, a, a big conference or get together where you all make the rules? of things you can do and you can't do or share grievances. I mean, is there, is there anything that doesn't get done at, outside of the, uh, the comedy clubs? No, we, we have groups that have fun together and are really blowing back. Bill Burr's blowing back. Dave Chappelle's blowing back. Here's the thing though. If you have power and money, that's what's funny about the comedians. Also Ricky Gervais, these guys have the power and the money to go, oh, I don't care what you do. You're not going to cancel me. I'm going to say whatever I want. That's that's what I was trying to tell you about the music business. Music business has lots of power, lots of money. And then the government has money. Media has money. So all these things can... How about... Here's here's one that I would be upset much more than somebody dropping an F-bomb, for instance. Like, who's, who's drawing the rules on that, too? FCC, a government agency? Like, who judges? What if I called you a fnifna? What if that was my F word? It was a horrible thing. I just called you a fnifna. It's all your intention. It doesn't matter. The language doesn't matter, but it means something. People put meaning to something. Whereas in the meantime, you know what means worse to me was much more effective? My children are affected by boner pill commercials. And she'll I, like it too. I, I, they, they, these people in the separate tubs, you know, they're taking Viagra. And even my kids going, <laughs> why are they in separate tubs if they want to make love? Holding hands. I mean, it doesn't make any sense that it's okay now. You and I did not grow up with any of these drug commercials. The most was a Marlboro man and a beer commercial. That's as bad as it got. <laughs> and now it's these drugs that have 9,000 effects. It's like, hey, I got rid of that, but now I have three toes and one testicle. But I got rid of the original problem. You know, <laughs> they told me that I had, that now I think I have it because I'm itchy. And they, they, they some things I pray those things. Then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy anyway. It's unbelievable how they they commandeered almost all commercials are either insurance companies or or big pharma, and we had none of that. Bare aspirin was the most we had when we were kids, and there weren't nineteen side effects that took up literally seven eighths of the commercial as side effects on these things. But we just sit back and go, it's okay, oh, it's all right. We're numb to it. Well, because they're they're all running scared from all that stuff. And and here's here's something to help put it into perspective. I was a radio DJ. 
completely different personality and rules uh, than what a, a, a comedian uh, does when they do a stand-up. But I didn't know that. Uh, I used to uh, host a morning show here in Wilmington, Delaware, where I would go to uh, a local comedy club, the Comedy Cabaret. Remember Andy right. Scarpatti? Of course. And um, I would introduce the first comedian on a Thursday morning or a th- Thursday evening, excuse me. Yeah. And I got paid serious money to do just that. And one time I went in there after doing this for a few months and I thought, you know, I got to give them something more. I got to give the people something more. Maybe they're curious what it's like for a disc jockey. And I was known when I'd go in there, people knew who I was Mitch in the morning, that maybe they need to, you know, understand some of what I go through that might they might find funny, something situational. So I just thought, I, I went on to the George Carlin, you know, seven words you can't say, and I blurted them out and uh, did my little, you know, F-bomb uh, tri- t- uh, tirade saying how frustrated I was that I couldn't do any of that on the radio. Yeah, I got finished with it doing the intro and Andy Scarpati's standing in the corner. He's like, come here, <laughs> come here. And I walked over to him and he said, no, that's definitely not. Who do you think you are? You're stepping across the line. You think you're a comedian. You're not even in the same ballpark. You're just a radio disc jockey that I pay to have you promote my, uh, my gigs right. on, uh, on the radio. And for you to drop the F bomb that early in a show is the, is the most rookie error that you could possibly make. For, he, he just completely reamed me out for doing it. Of course, I was not invited back again. But wow. it made me oh, scratch wow. my head. It made me scratch my head and say, aha, you know, how, how is it for a comedian to go on stage and do what they do? And how long do they have to hone those skills to do the right thing and not do the right thing or make mistakes until they get to a level where they know how to do uh, what people are expecting? It was part of the people were, were cued to expect a real comedian to come up and do their uh, and do their stand up, and here I am, the the local disc jockey that they may know. I mean, they may like my show, right, but, but as a comedian, you're up there because you're a local celebrity. You and, got it. But uh, I think there's something between the two. I think that's a little dramatic. Definitely not to have you back is no good. But I think to pull you aside and say, listen, for me personally, if I'm the headliner, I don't want somebody dropping f bombs ahead of me. So that's just that's one of the protocols that's just unspoken or spoken that you just don't do that it kind of like just it, it puts the crowd into a different frame of mind you want them in the headliners frame of mind not the opening acts frame of right, mind right and that's so i can understand that but not to get rid of you just so the next week you should have gone up and told a dad joke and said hey welcome or whatever so you learn your lesson but that's what i'm trying to say is you got canceled you were you were OG canceled. <laughs> that's that's like that's an OG canceling right there. Uh, you were canceled and shouldn't have been. You should have been. Somebody should pull people aside and get, educate them if they need to be, or listen for clarification. I tell people that work for me. I have a number of people that work. I say, or anybody, any of my relationships. Like, uh, just ask me for clarification. If you ask me to clarify something, one hundred percent, not ninety nine, one hundred percent of the time, my intentions are good. I'm not, in, I'm not intending on hurting you. I'm not intending on offending you. My intentions are good intentions. Now, you can ask me for clarification. I will let you know. And then you can clarify for me how you were offended. And maybe then I can make a decision on the next time I say the word or next time whatever it is. And there's so much education that's going on there. But by the way, there's no school about this. There's no group. There's no head of the group that says here's what I tell you. The other day when this woman was saying to me, she kept saying it to almost like intentionally. Well, they, they make their own choices and they, they chose this school and they're, they're, they aren't doing well in school right now, but they will. And I'm thinking she's talking about twins. And I, so is it my ignorance? Yeah, I'm, I'm catching up. And my other friend, I performed at his daughter's bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah. I performed there. So whenever I see him, hey, remember those days? And now that's a they. So am I supposed to say, how's your Vader? I don't know what to, I don't know what to say, you know, but am I an ass? Am I punching down? Am I insulting? No, I'm just saying, Hey, this is all tough to get, to get used to. Okay. It's really tough when the vernacular changes, these words change the, the meanings change the things, the word bitch I was talking about earlier, that's changed. And it's biatch. Oh, that softens it. All this BS. It's a bunch of BS and it's all going to catch up to everyone. Hollywood, does this, by does the way, make you want to uh, retire? I've already retired once, but then Uh-oh. 
and it, it brought me back because listen, I, I love making people laugh. I really do. And I do it well and still the highest level and standing ovations and they're really digging what I do. And by the way, I don't get political on my show. I get self-deprecating. So if there's something, I tell a story, I tell you this real quick story. My mom's starting to lose her hearing and she's walking down this hill, um, this little ravine and this guy comes up behind her. She's not wearing her hearing aid. He says, Steve Hill. She goes, hi, Steve Hill, Barbara Shoemaker. Nice to meet you. So. The story gets worse. And this is not, so this is an innocent story to make you laugh. It's a perfect example of there's no racism whatsoever, but there's racism out there and perspectives and you can't say that. It's all part of this story. We're driving in LA. She goes, Craig, not wearing a hearing aid. What are you going to do about that flood at your house? I go, that's all right, mom. I got my own wet vac. You know, the wet vac, wet vac, wet vac. She yeah. thought I said a derogatory term for a Mexican. And you all wow. know what the word is, right? So she knows I'm not the way. She's really shocked. That's what she, she goes, my, my, Craig, that's an awful thing to say. And I go, what are you talking about, Mom? A lot of people have them. It's California, El Nino. They're a necessity. <laughs> and she says, you have your own? I go, yeah, mine's in the garage. It's handy. And this goes on for 10 minutes, this misunderstanding. 10 minutes, right? And finally she goes, well, where do you get one? <laughs> I go, right in front of Home Depot. I swear, 100% true story, eight people walked out one night telling that story. Now, wow. you tell me, Alexander, why are they walking out? Give me the root of why they're walking out. That's a tough one. Um, it's hard to know what people yeah. are, what, uh, what is going through people's minds because I think people get upset and offended for many different reasons. I think some people just right. get upset because, for the sake of getting upset because somebody said something that was uh, marginally edgy. You know, it's like you can't even just be edgy anymore, right? So uh, I think people what's, look... What's the, what, what's the root of them walking out? What, um, they're walking out, eight of them, they're walking out and go, can you believe he blank? What did I say? Didn't say the word, right? Didn't say anything offensive about anyone. Hadn't made a mistake. This is an example of what I'm saying People go nuts for, I remember a woman leapt out of her seat. She was, yeah. I was doing yeah. a corporate gig and I did this, another mistake I made. I texted this guy, he kept annoying me. I was driving. I said, I'm driving, I'm driving. He said, I'm on the golf course. I'm waiting for you. I'm at the driving range. Our tea time's coming up. Finally, I text him and the L is next to the K and I had big thumbs and it came out. When I get there, I'm going to lick your ass. Now, <laughs> that's a mistake. We all know the K. It's is a golf what term. I, right. Kick. Yeah, kick, right? And he wasn't there when I showed up, by the way. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But the point is, this woman leapt out of her seat. He said that I wasn't saying that's what I was doing. I wasn't saying anything dirty. I was saying that's the word that came out in my mistake. Someone else said something. She said, uh, message me. No, she, she, wrote mis she wrote massage me, but it turned out it was message me. I'm like, do you want cream or oil? You know, all these mistakes that we all make. They're innocent mistakes, but are you just, oh, that one, that one sounded offensive. Oh, that one sounded racist. Oh, that one seemed pretty innocent. Whatever it is, we don't need to analyze. Laugh or don't or walk away if, you, if you're looking to be offended. That's the bottom line. Yeah, and I, you I also always have the option. Absolutely, and I, I think also it, it, it's going to make you insane if you, if you constantly analyze and I think think about, and I imagine for you as somebody who has to get up on stage, you can't really think about all these people. Like you're asking me that question, like, why do these people get up? I mean, for me, I've never, ever gotten up at a stand-up show, even if I didn't like the material. I just, I'm, I first of all, I paid for it. I'm going to sit here and listen to the whole thing because I want to get all the context. I want to see how they, you know, a lot of times comedians, they always wrap their show. They bring that joke back around from what they started with. You know, they tie it all, put a bow on it. So I want to see the whole thing before I judge it. But um, I imagine... It, it would drive you crazy if you worry about ev what everybody's thinking about. Why people? Who cares if they leave? Too. It's like if somebody unsubscribed to this podcast. Okay, see ya. You didn't like it. That's your prerogative. And that actually brings up another point. Why do people like to hate on things now? They spend so yes. much energy so much writing time, emails, yeah. writing social media messages. If you don't like the person, just Let don't go. pay attention. Just go away. Just go away. Yeah. Vote. Vote your with your remote. It's, it's a mob mentality that's in fashion to be that way right now, to be upset on behalf of somebody else. 
Um, I, I don't want to change the subject too much, but I do want to ask the question before you have to go, Craig. Uh, how does a radio personality uh, become relevant in a world that's gone gone mad? You know, as a comedian, you may not have a, a corporate overlord, you know, uh, hanging on every word that you say and critiquing you after your show and giving you notes or whatever. Maybe yeah. you do. Uh, but on radio, you do have a, a whole load of people. Uh, and the complaint is that radio has been so homogenized and uh, wound out. There's no real personality, at least on terrestrial radio. Howard can do his thing on satellite. But mm -hmm. it's very hard to be a relevant radio personality because you've got so many layers of permissions and things you can and you can't do. It's one of the reasons I got out of it 20 years ago because He's I just a, couldn't he, deal with Howard, that oversight. Uh, Howard Stern is a great example, though. What I mentioned about Bill Burr and, and Ricky Gervais and Chris Rock and they can do whatever they want. Once you get power and money, you can then do what you want. Howard Stern was on terrestrial radio saying the crudest things that you couldn't have said one moment without being fired in Wilmington. Not one of those things that he did on a successful radio show could you have done. But he had to acquire the power first. People turn their heads when there's power. And that's, and that's unfortunate, but they're going to go for the independent. That's unfortunate, too. We are independent people. Unfortunately, you working in radio, not independent because you are beholden to these people. You couldn't say, I've said this for years, I don't watch the news anymore. I will not watch the news. There's no reason to watch the news. They, they choose the news for you to see that keeps you in fear. And what they're choosing would never be something that would bite the hand that feeds them. They would never put something about this corporation that's poisoning our food. You think there would be a story about that? And that has an effect of us on us much more than a curse word, much more than a reframing of something, it, much more than alleged racism is this poisoning that's going on. You can't talk about it, though. And it's all, they, they, they literally go, that's political. That's political? Yeah, it's something that's ethical. But, but comedians want to point this stuff out. Don't walk away from it. Wait. By the way, if you don't like one joke, wait 10 minutes. Another joke's coming your way. Guarantee you're going to like one of them. They're not on stage because and getting cover charges because they stink. They're not on charge for you, on stage so you can just sit back with your arms crossed and judge. They're on stage to entertain you, to lift you from this paradigm that's out there, from this cycle of deceit that's just out there. We're here to go, oh, here we are over here. Let's all have common sense. Let's all think. Let's be logical. Let's be ethical. Let's be moral. That's the irony is they think the comedians, because you use a bad language, is immoral. It's immoral that what these people are doing. By the way, the ones who are doing the most, the ones who are really doing some real seedy stuff, they're the ones who are the loudest because they're trying to deflect from themselves. You know the whole Epstein Island list? Yeah. And now the P. Diddy and then... Uh, there's a, it's countless what's going on. And Hollywood's starting to come down now. I don't know if people aren't watching the Oscars as much anymore because people are tired of it. I don't watch anymore. I used to love the Oscars. I lived for movies. What movies are great anymore? Because every movie's, uh, let's get diversity for diversity's sake, not something that's real. It's anachronistic, by the way. If you put a certain ethnic group in a, in like a, a, pic, a, a movie that's about Rome, <laughs> you know what I mean? A Rome, uh, the Caesar's Rome, and, and all of a sudden, oh, here, here, here comes a, here comes an Asian trans, you know, <laughs> to, to, to cast to be cast. Whatever it is, it's like we get it that you're now being phony. You're just putting that in because you had a mandate in Hollywood. By the way, Mitch, you yes, and sure. I are so done in Hollywood. They literally said, <laughs> "Don't even bother." <laughs> You know what I'm up for right now? Like, I don't what? even I don't even bother, like, auditioning. I'm not even sent anything unless it's, like, some some racist general from the Civil War. I can play that, right? <laughs> oh, it's, it is such a joke. Do you know what I'm up for right now that they're coming on to me? The only thing is the Golden Bachelor. <laughs> nice. Nice. Do, and do people are saying, take it. Do you think comedy is a form of passive aggression? in the sense that um, it allows you to have a conversation that you can't normally have in the real world. And today, in the real world, you can't talk very far before you run into some, some wall, whether it's political or political correctness or whatever the term might be. It, it seems that if you go to a, uh, a, to a comedy uh, place, it allows you to laugh at, at things that you couldn't normally laugh at in real life. 
Don't yeah. you feel that that's, that's that you're you're you know actually doing some public service there? hundred percent. You know, when they shut down the pandemic, they shut down comedy was one of the first things to go shut down. I I said we're essential workers because think about if laughter is the best medicine, how come nobody goes to a comedy club for their pharmacy? Literally, it's the best medicine. It's been proven time and time again. Do you think Big Pharma wants you to know that? Do you have a pharmacy within you that you could access at any comedy club? They shut us down for years. I was doing Zoom shows. And, and, uh, I'm so happy to be wearing pants again, by the way. Uh, it's, it's, uh, my career is sore. Nice. I was doing shows. I did a show in the backyard of Harrison Ford's old house, his backyard, and the people were across a swimming pool. The other, uh, the audience was across the pool. I just kept picturing him yelling at his kids when they were growing up, do another lap, damn it. Come on, you call that a breaststroke? I just kept picturing they had this lap pool in front of us. We were doing shows like in parking lots. It was the most ridiculous, but, you, but he was using common sense. I said, we need to laugh. And you know what they did when we came back? Partitions between the seats for an airborne virus. I say, hey, try doing a kimchi Korean barbecue burp right now and see if they smell it over there in row two. Yeah, try that. It's an airborne virus. People turn into morons with the pandemic too. And if you said anything, they get mad at you because they had a, they believed what they were told. They were believed. I, my golf course had foam, plastic foam inside of the hole so the ball wouldn't go to the bottom. Like the COVID was down another three inches, but up here, oh, it's that, not there. That's hilarious. <laughs> I still see people. I don't understand why I see people by themselves, okay, in a car. With the windows, they're driving by themselves, and they're wearing a mask. What are you doing? I talk about that in my what, act. Where are you, you going to get that. COVID yeah. in the radio? Like, I don't understand. Oh, it's coming through the moonroof. I mean, uh, th that hitchhiker over there has got it. You know, it's, it's just it's zooming in. Oh, all the insanity. How about the people with masks? And they're always yelling. These are the woke people projecting. Put a mask on. Meanwhile, their nose is sticking out. It's like putting a condom on your testicles. I mean, <laughs> what in the <laughs> hell happened to people's logic? It makes no sense. And then you take the mask off but when you're eating. So who knew that the cure for COVID was a steak in front of you? I'm walking around I'm walking around Vegas with a chicken bone. I'm building a perimeter. I have food. There's no <laughs> COVID coming near me. I have food. I can say all this now. Do you know I couldn't say it back then? Because people go nuts. You masking is masking. I was told by the you know, you do your research, and it's science. Trust science. Uh, did, did trust science? Any scientist? Uh, did they trust Joseph Mengele in Nazi Germany? Yeah, they did. But it doesn't make any sense, and that's where comedians come in. We're going to say, we're going to expose it, and I, my thought is laugh at yourself, even if you did believe this crap. Laugh I think at when yourself. We, when we get to a point, it, and by the way, I agree with you. Uh, when you get to a point where we can look back on the whole COVID thing and sort of laugh it off as just a, we could sort of like treat it like disco. You know, we dressed funny, uh, we danced funny. That uh, COVID was just sort of another. Can form I use of that? Disco. Can I use that? That's going to my act. Oh, please, please. I didn't write it, because... but I'm here to ask. I'm asking for permission. Andy Scarpetti should not have fired you just for that good joke. <laughs> Andy did me a favor. He made me think. He made me stop and think for a second. Was so a, Andy, that's a good joke. We're going to look at it like this. Guy. Andy, we'd love to We'd love to have you back uh, in Wilmington, uh, Andy, but you got a lot of clubs up in PA. Do you, do you still perform at his uh, places? I have not in a long time. I still remember his numbers, 215-32-COMIC. I'm going to probably call him after this to say I was on Mitch Hill's show. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Def remind him of the, uh, the famous F-bomb uh, appearance that yeah. I made. And put way, me in my back, place. way back with Andy, I think my first television show actually ever was Focus Delaware. That was my oh, first. I remember that. Remember and that? And you never got on uh, the uh, Polska Kielbasa uh, Polish show with Ziggy Gorski. I was think that, I we did had a that classic one. Uh, Polish AM, dude. AM Philadelphia. These were the good yeah. old days when I didn't. Now I've got so many credits, it's, and it's a joke. Who cares? Well, you've anymore? done movies, uh, oh, you've yeah. done TV shows, uh, and I don't know the half of it. But aren't you doing a, a regular podcast, too? And feel free to yeah. uh, to promote yes, it. Tell, uh, tell please, us what it is. Yeah, please check it out. It's called Still Standing Up. i got my celebrity guests that come in and other people that – I'm trying to build a bridge from the spiritual community to the comedy community because I think spiritual people are too serious. They think you need to sit on a rock in Sedona for your enlightenment, and I think the comedians are too cynical – and cut off. They don't understand that their truth telling is spirit and that's higher source. And and I'm really 
about, I speak about this now, healing powers of laughter. And I mean laughter, not jokes, not comedy, laughter. Laughter is so good for us. Oxidate your body, healing endorphins are released. Stress is relieved. You know, stress is the biggest cause of illness. Yeah. So why not relieve the stress with the comedy? Oh, do you think they want to hear that? No, pop a pill, make it easy. It's it's so easy to access. I do guided laughitation now. I teach this thing, guided laughitation. Yeah, I've had all these accolades and all these things. A community or American Comedy Award, the biggest award you can win. I got Emmys. But here's my most proud moment. I have to share this with you. I'm, I'm saying this with all humility, this trophy that I, I got. This is the horse's ass award I got at my ex-wife's family reunion. <laughs> it's a Clark family reunion. And I, I earned this. I know I don't, I'm not a bragger, but I, I will tell you that no one else came close to winning this but me, the <laughs> horse's ass award in 02. That is my proudest achievement. What is it like living in, uh, I guess you're in Hollywood, right? Or at least around LA? Yeah, outside city. LA. I live near the Kardashians. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. How did you, what made you go from Philadelphia to LA? Because I was offered the opportunity to do it. And I just said, no way, I'd be a dead man inside well, six months. It, I, I have to tell you, it's it's been great. I love it out here. Um, you know, there are phonies I can't stand. I mean, you just find somebody who's not. Find the East Coasters. Find the real people, the authentic people. And oddly enough, there's all the suburban areas. Are, they're not L.A. It's like being, you know, in Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania. I mean, it's literally where I live is that you couldn't tell that you're like in California with all that, you know, goes on. Hollywood's just this tiny little community, but they make it look like it's big because they have all the mandates. They decide what goes on TV. They decide what's woke and what's not. But really, if you go around America, so I happen to be really big in California and Irvine, Pasadena, Hermosa Beach, Brea, Ontario, the list is endless. So I've really made a career out here, even more so than the East Coast. I do have a show coming up. You should come to the show. Uh, uh, I will. I, June, I think June 7th. It's on craigshoemaker.com. But I'm in Sellersville, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. That's not too far away. No. And you have one in Lansdale, too? It's close to there. Yeah. It's yeah. close to Lansdale. It's in Quaker Town. But it's in a theater. It's a 100-year-old theater. It was built when you and I were born. And it's still there, like we are. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, it's funny. I mean, you and I have been friends for many, many years, and we've had a low maintenance friendship, uh, which still survives time. Since the I 80s, think. But since the eighties, back in the eighties, you and I were the 80s. original gangsters. Uh, I, I used to hire you to come in and do voices uh, yeah. for commercials for uh, for radio That's spots. Right. You That's were right. doing like uh, Ricky uh, um, Ricardo. On one spot, I recall. I did it. impressions. Just, I did a lot of impressions back then. And you did a you did a great job with it. But we both went kind of our separate ways. But we also had a little baggage that went along with that. And both of us sort of healed ourselves. I healed mine yeah. by uh, just getting out of the business, and you you healed it by embracing it and and being part of it. I mean, it it, it you know could have gone the other way for either of us uh, surviving I, 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 I being in the eighties. I healed it by healing my insides. Everything that's happened to me happened for me. And I really look at that. I embrace it. I told you I was kidnapped. I had suicide attempts and drug addiction, alcoholism. I mean, I did die at one time of an overdose. I mean, I really had what one would think would be a rough road, but it's led to this unbelievable bliss and happiness in my life. And now I get to teach other people how that, you know, I have a course that I have. I'm, winning with laughter and I, I, I was keynote speaking and I one-on-one -on -one clients and they're from all over. And I love uplifting people and giving them tools that I've learned. And I share this gained wisdom with them while having fun and finding the laughs, you know, like this interview, we had some laughs today, but we also, you know, got down with it and told some truths and things like that. People don't want to hear it sometimes, but sometimes that's where the growth happens. When you hear something you don't want to hear, when you're in your comfort zone, you're out of your comfort zone, that's when the true laughs, that's when the true transformation, that's when the true journey takes place, is if you can get outside of that zone. And I got outside, it was comfortable for me to be a derelict. It was comfortable, it was easy. Oh, here's, I used to get paid in white, white or green. <laughs> I, and I just played Erie for the first time since those days, white or green, I took the white. I had one time in Pittsburgh, outside Pittsburgh, guy shows up with a, a blowtorch uh, to do uh, free base, <laughs> free base. 
Oh, that was the pay. Yikes. And I was glad to take it. Was like, that was then, right? not now, just so we get that clear. That's Of course, that's what I'm yeah. saying is I'm on the other side of that healing took place where it's not even an option today. It's not even an option. The only options for me are I'm going to stay in my presence, my mindfulness, and really whatever comes out of me, I call it genuine energy flow, that comes out, and it's natural. It's organic. It's, it's something authentic. And we all should be authentic, right? Shouldn't that keeping be what it, we all Keeping it real. Be? And, yeah. you know, the neat thing about you is that I, I've known you good, bad, and the ugly uh, days, as it were. And I was right there with you. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have managed to pull yourself out of it and not only fix yourself, now, now you're fixing other people. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said for that. I'm doing a podcast not because I've got this irresistible urge to get back on the air, kind of. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to do it and have, have it be you know, something that was giving back. And the fact that you would do the show, first of all, I greatly appreciate because you are an A-lister as far as I'm concerned, coming from the West Coast, but also from the past. And keeping it real, there's nothing better than that. And that's what this show is all about, is that I am the last angry DJ. Uh, <laughs> Alex is the second to last uh, angry DJ. And I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing over the fact that I'm no longer relevant where I used to be at my age and at my I'll uh, I'll career I'll point. I'll tell you how irrelevant you are that you would use the word DJ. <laughs> exactly. People, young people, what's a disc? A jockey? Are you going to ride? Are you going to mount this thing with a saddle? <laughs> going to mount the, the, the disc? Yeah, even that's out. Even uh, I, I say records. You can't say, uh, or I say, uh, I, I have a tape of that. That's out. But again, it's similar to the language that people are on you. See, that's now that's qualified as innocent. Oh, he's innocent or he's stupid or whatever. He's making fun of himself for these words that have changed. But so have those other words that are you're not utterable. Those have also changed and we're trying to catch up. It's the same scope. It's the same arena. It's all it's, the same. It, it, it's it has okay a lot to, to do talk with, about all of it. It's okay that I say a goat used to be somebody that dropped the ball instead of the greatest of all time. It's okay. Well, right? in my time, a goat was a, a GTO Pontiac, but that's just me. Oh, oh yeah. Craig, I'm going to let Oh, by the way, I, that's another problem I have is what we're doing to the kids, the names of their cars. It's, it, I swear it's uh, unbelievable. It's Here horrific. Comes. I mean, we wanted a Mustang, we wanted a Camaro, a GTO, a Charger. What do they give now? A Prius. A fiesta. I'm gonna roll up in my fiesta. How about my son's gonna bond with his kids? My dad got me an electric Nissan Leaf, a Leaf thing. Woo! The sound it purred like a toaster oven. It's because it is a toaster oven. We're giving them toaster ovens to drive, and it drives themselves. We drove a stick. We popped the clutch. We used an ignition. We didn't get carpal tunnel syndrome from turning an ignition. Now you just get in. Woo! It starts itself. They don't have to do anything anymore. You're gonna make me stroke out. Look how red my face is. I'm gonna sound like oh, I'm gonna sound like a grumpy old get off my lawn uh, uh, crank OG cranky. That's what I call myself OG. Cranky. You know there there is there are some advantages to being older uh, and complaining about things. Is that you know they they all of a sudden will tell you oh those cyclamates or uh, saccharin or some other you know added a food additive that uh, we've been using all all I don't worry about them anymore because they say well you know if you use that uh, that kind of milk or that kind of whatever uh that it it's it's bad for you it'll bring on early onset uh, alzheimers and i usually just say too late <laughs> that's my answer to everything too late it's all too late oh you know? my God. so that's the an sugar, advantage of being older you already... how about the sugar in the morning we would have a pile of sugar on top of the cereal with the milk you eat some it disappears. You dump more until you get down to the best part, the glucose quicksand. Now, that was <laughs> high. That was getting high when you are a kid. And Captain Crunch, you had to soak it for four days before you could eat it safely. Nothing Anything better. Short, four days, you're like, you have curtains hanging down from your mouth. I can't like, call you. People, the roof <laughs> off of my mouth. Craig, I'm gonna let Mitch. Toy have, with you. I'm gonna let Mitch have the last word. But uh, do you ever uh, have you ever done dates in Canada? I'm just curious what you think of Canadian audiences versus American audiences for comedy specifically. Love, at least I used to love. I don't know if they're still the same because I I know that um, there's some the woke ha the woke has been contagious there as well. Unfortunately, went across the border to the north, and I, I but. 
I remember the audiences I went, the always the best. Canadian audiences are absolutely smart, aware. And by the way, depending on where, you know, obviously Calgary is a whole other world than Montreal. You're going to get some cowboys and things like that. So it's a whole other <laughs> unwoke AF. And, uh, but I tell you, Canada itself, I've, I, I, you know, if it wasn't for <laughs> the cold, you know, I'd comp contemplate going there. At times I did. And then, and also your approach to the pandemic was no better than ours either. So, you know, I, I, that's when I almost moved from California. The approach was unbelievably stupid here. And Florida, of all places, known as, you know, eating faces and sleeping with their, their teachers. I mean, it was always known as the worst in Florida. I'll go, oh, I might move here. Because <laughs> just because their approach to that. But everything's wow. sort of balancing out and working out, you know. It always does, doesn't it? So it will. There you go. We'll just, we'll just remain cranky. As we're uh, as we're wrapping up here, uh, biggest influences for you in your career and in your life? Oh, no question, Bruce Springsteen, my number one influence. Wow, cool. Spectrum, Spectrum nineteen eighty five. Uh, there he was, born the USA tour, and I said to myself, I want to do that. He brings it from the heels. He's truthful. He's honest. He tells the truth of who he is in his songs and his interstitial. I still remember him telling the story that night about him sneaking into Graceland. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell true stories, and I'm going to give them everything I have. I do the longest show of any comedians. Uh, there's no comedians who do as long a show as I do, and that's what Springsteen is known for. And people walk out of my show, and they go, wow, thank you. And they standing ovations, and that's what I'm – so he's my number one – still to this day, my number one influence. And, and uh, Canadian Bruce here. ended up on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm on last uh, week at uh, show, so I that must have really that. caught your attention. I didn't see it yet, but I did see the photo, and I'm friends with Jeff Garland. I go way back. I go back as far with him as I do you. I mean, back in the 80s, we have a uh, – he has a funny story. He does it in his act, and I'm in the story about swimming naked in a fountain in a mall. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, it's you true. left me with that visual. I'm sorry. It's yeah, just, uh, I know it's a bad visual. At least, at least it'll it'll kind of make the visual soften it a little bit because I was 23 at the time, so I I didn't have the body I have now. That would be a bad visual. <laughs> so, I think you were doing I, okay. It, By the way, uh, Jeff Garland and Susie Essman has a great uh, program on HBO called The Making of Kirby yeah. Enthusiasm, which yeah. is in its last season. I love it. I am the Larry David of Wilmington, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. I'm the I'm guy in the line at the uh, the drugstore that complains about the announcement over the uh, PA and the person jumping up in front of the line. I say, hey, excuse me. Yeah. So it's always it's always a thing. Great program. Uh, Thank excellent you. input. I appreciate your your healing words and and your laughter and comedy. Uh, and it's also something that's uh, to be able to catch up with you again because I haven't talked to you in ages. Yeah. It's been quite some time. Last I talked to you, you were married to Nancy Allen. Sorry oh to drop God. that one. Oh, no. Sorry. I brought the whole oh, thing man. down. Sorry about we, that. We should have ended five minutes ago. Gee, <laughs> I'm going to bring my exes now. I'm the X-Files. So, <laughs> well, pleasure hanging with you. I'm not going to talk about any of your past, okay? <laughs> Please, feel free. I'm single, and I live alone, so no damage could be done. And as you said, I burned my bridges out in L.A., so I'm not allowed uh, west of the Mississippi. It's not going to happen. Well, they have people posted there. It's like a wall they're going to build just for me. Thank you for having me, guys. Pleasure meeting you, Alexander. Thank you. You too. Keep this guy in line, all right? Yeah, I'm going to try. You. Craig, See, thanks Craig, a lot, buddy. Craig Shoemaker. Oh, official Craig Shoemaker on Instagram. I want to see, see my numbers boost way up after I was on this show. Well, we have uh, five people watching right now, so expect a huge uh, increase. In, hey, you got to start on, somewhere, five, Craig. Can those five people go to official Craig Shoemaker right now? Just, just so I know that it clicked. All right, I know I'll, that I'm leaving one of them, my though, children, the leave, left my children for an hour. They're going, what's Daddy doing? Daddy's talking to some old man who's a cranky <laughs> old man who's who's angry, an old angry DJ. He's going to talk to him for five people, kids. That's what's going to put dinner on the table. <laughs> so there you go. At least somebody follow me. All right, all right. See all right, you. pal. Thanks, Thank you guys. Take care of yourself. Be good. You See you. Oh, that was that was great. What a good guy. Very giving. Uh, Craig has always been that way. He's always been willing to share 
uh, and give uh, give so much back in the process. And he truly wants to make you laugh. He really does. It's just it's a shame that uh, comedians that want to make you laugh, which is a what's a wonderful gift to give. It's so hard for them to uh, to accomplish that in today's world. And it's a it's another frustration factor that makes me angry that uh, yeah. similar things are happening in the radio business. Uh, it's very hard to make people laugh anymore. Yeah. And so I was, they keep it. Yeah. Keep it sanitized. I was looking at the we still have some people in chat here, uh, but from from earlier on. But I was um, oops, cut to the wrong thing there. Uh, yeah, I was um, I was just thinking and I, and I was saying this in the chat, too, that sometimes we need to talk about things that make us feel uncomfortable. And I think that's one of the that's one of the jobs too of comedians. And you don't always have to necessarily like all every single joke they make, or like all of their material. But you know, and certainly there are comedians that I like where I've gone to a show and a couple jokes just don't land with me personally. But like Craig said, you know, eventually just wait ten minutes. There's going to be another joke, and maybe that one will resonate with you, right? So I just think we need to be open minded and, and give people a chance, give people opportunities, uh, and don't just walk at the, just. Don't walk out of a comedy club. Just you paid for the ticket. Just sit there. Just do yourself a favor. Just watch the whole thing and then think about. Nobody it. cares about your drama, right? Just think Not about. Unless you get a talk show or a podcast, There's then no, you can be drama there. I don't understand. But you don't. You don't earn a right to make that decision. And you know, Craig is a guy that's at the top of his game. He's got plenty of experience, uh, as opposed to my gaffe that I explained what happened when I was introduced. I thought maybe I could cross that line into giving people something for their money. And it turned out to be a giant bomb, but, uh, you get, uh, people have to know their place and being in a radio, uh, uh, presenter instead of a DJ is the lowest rung of show business. As far as that goes, it doesn't even rate, uh, doesn't even make a noise where, uh, comedians are concerned, but Craig is a good guy to have on this kind of a program because again, he's talking about some of the root causes of what makes uh, the world the way it is today. And I'm encouraged. Here's my takeaway from the conversation. He says things have turned a corner and the pendulum's beginning to swing the other way. Very encouraged by so. uh, that fact. And uh, we'll have him back and uh, report back on whether or not uh, it's yep. working. And we want to make sure that our five listeners uh, have made a uh, impact. By the way, it's five live listeners, not the total number of people that are watching the podcast or listening to the podcast after the fact. I don't want to make apologies for it because I think it's great that we have a handful of people uh, listening yeah. and watching the program, listening and watching while we're recording live and then uh, catching us later on. How do, how do they con contact us, by the way? Well, people can email us for now. Uh, you can send an email to hello at the angry, the last angry DJ.com. That's hello at the last angry DJ.com. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at the last angry DJ is our handle. We've got YouTube shorts out there that go out. And the audio version of this podcast, if you don't want to look at our mugs, goes out usually the day after this uh, streams live. So be aware of that. And uh, we'll be uh, publishing our, we, we've got a website in the works, so we got more things uh, being worked on as well. And I just wanted to just say, you know, my takeaway from this episode too, this really resonated with me that Craig said about, about the healing power of laughter, which is so true, because I've experienced this and there's something about the collective energy of people in a room together reacting to something that somebody is saying and it's different. I mean, it is a much different vibe from just sitting on a couch and watching stand-up comedy by myself in my apartment. It is a totally different experience to go live. It is such a different energy, and I always feel revitalized after a comedy show. So if you haven't been to one in a while, this is a good time now to remind people, go out and see somebody. Is it the same for you when you go to a movie, at a movie theater, instead of watching oh, man. Yeah, uh, at home, I, seeing the reaction of everybody? Yeah, there's something about when, when I go to a movie with friends, just the collective experience of just like gasping or being shocked about something or, or laughing at something funny. It's, it's that collective energy. I don't know how to describe it, but uh, it makes you feel different. It is a much different experience. And uh, we don't do it all that often anymore. And I understand uh, some people don't like going to movie theaters. They don't like going to public spaces. But if you can, once in a while, get out of your comfort zone. Because I'm very introverted. Look, I don't like going. I don't like people all that much. I don't like busy spaces. But once in a while, 
I force myself to go to a movie. I force myself to go to a comedy show or I go to a live band. And uh, you got to do it once in a while. That's all I'm saying. Well, that's a good that's a good thing to do. I got a great gag if you want to try it with your friends. Uh, go see a um, a showing of Mr. Good Bar. Uh, and at the end, which is the most depressing end you've ever seen, have all of your friends laugh at the same time. Um, everybody will get very shocked and upset and then walk out at the very end of looking for Mr. Good Bar, <laughs> a classic. Again, a reference that none of you understand except your older folks that are watching, but they're they're the only ones laughing right now saying, I, I get it, I get it, Mitch. Thanks a lot. As always, Alex, thank you for your help and uh, your uh, production ability. Alex is the one who puts all the technical stuff together, including uh, show, having to show up on all the uh, podcast uh, uh, usual suspects. Who I, are they all? I it's do like what I do. Apple, Spotify. Everywhere. Apple, uh, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Amazon Alexa. You can ask your, your – uh, see, I just, I just said the magic word. Everybody's devices are just ringing now and – but anyways, we're we're available. So you can everywhere. say a magic word. All platforms. And if it's uh, Instagram, we're like this. We're I gotta stay inside. Our here. heads are our heads are a little big. Maybe yours yours more so than mine. Mine is little, huge. Far, Just, it looms a little further My away. My head looms. Yeah, yeah. I a little, a little too screen. much, Mitch. There in those. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna videos. work on that. I'm working on it. And I'm a little red in the face, but we're, we're working on that too. We got all kinds of technical things. But for the six people now, <laughs> we just got one more person. We just increased our uh, audience by uh, 20%, I guess. I don't know. Uh, it's always good to have uh, our folks that are here for the live taping of the show. And, of course, always down the road where they get a chance to see it as a podcast. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. Uh, why don't you tell us who our guest is next week here on many of these same Last Angry DJ channels. Yeah, next week we're going to have uh, a very famous guy from the world famous Sea Fox. That's right, the world famous Sea Fox from a show called The Larry and Willie Show. So if you grew up in uh, in Vancouver listening to Sea Fox, a very popular rock station, that show started in the late 80s, went on for over well over a decade. I think that show ended on Sea Fox in the late 90s, then they took it to Rock 101, The Larry and Willie Show. So we're going to have Larry Hennessy on the program who is not only a, a seasoned broadcaster and a, and a really funny guy, great at improv, but uh, is also a musician and a microphone nerd. He's got a vintage microphone collection, over 500 microphones. He's turned that into a microphone rental business, so we'll probably have him talk a little bit about that. Uh, he's got his own home studio, so he's, he's really into that sort of stuff. So uh, I'm sure he'll share lots of crazy stories. It'll be good. Yeah, I want to know how to be, continue to be relevant uh, in this day and age when you had a, a hot show in the 90s. That's going to be a very interesting uh, conversation. Absolutely. And again, we we want to include our, our brothers and sisters up north, across the Great White North, uh, you know, from Canada. Interesting thing about the uh, people, one of the common questions that I get from folks is, why does my station start with a W or a K? Uh, here's how it works. on In, in the United States... Uh, if you're east of the Mississippi, generally, not all, uh, most stations are starts with a W to identify its location. Although there are exceptions to that. Pittsburgh, there's a KQV. Uh, in Philadelphia, there's a KYW. They, they all were grandfathered in, so that's why there's an exception to that rule. On the other side, it's K, K something. So it could be K Earth or K something. Uh, and when you go above the line into uh, Canada, it's C. Like the big CKLW was the big station, and C Fox nowadays is the uh, other. So C K W, C K L W, interesting. And if you go into uh, Mexico, it's X, like X marks the spot. And then different parts of the world, uh, Bermuda, for example, it starts with a Z or Z, as they say. So it's kind of cool. I'm not sure what to make of our call letters. T L A D J. It's way too many. It's, too, too it many sounds letters. like another. LGBTQ uh, uh, thing. I, I, would I, you shorten I, that? I don't even. What's that? Would you shorten it? What? What would no, you No, I think it's fine. It? Go ahead. Yeah, T if I you like, can't I like say it. the last angry DJ, then say T L T L A D J. What was the rest of uh, Yeah, say your own acronym. Make up your own. The show. The show. Because someday we're going to go from six. Now we're at seven. We're at seven people watching now. Thank you. It's like a, uh, a, a telethon. Keep giving. If you don't give, we can't stay our broadcast uh, day. I'm so curious who's watching. Give until actually. it hurts. Don't, don't any amount of money helps. One dollar, two dollars. I'm just kidding. We don't need any money from you right now. Right now. But I am crowdsourcing a haircut because this hair has got to go. 
I got it. Next time you see, it's probably going to be uh, last angry DJ. You don't have a haircut. pair of uh, you don't have a pair of scissors there. You can cut that yourself. I got a Floby, but I'm um. You got a weed whacker. Plug you it got in. a weed whacker. What about that? Weed whacker would be yeah, painful. You just take that, take that to your noggin. Shave it, shave it, and you know we could do a fundraiser. I said if uh, you know, it's the low hanging fruit comedy. Here it comes. Uh, if Alex were to shave his uh, top knot off. Uh, for a certain amount of money coming in to help us buy stuff. Look at that. What do you call that? Does it have a name? Does it have a name? I think that is technically a tuft. A tuft. A tuft. A very small concentrated it's not a area. It's a tuft. Like in Canada, it's, it's a, a tuft. tuft. It's a tuft. Okay, That's good. What it is. It's, it's uniquely yours, so keep it, brother. Looks fine. All right, that wraps us up. Until next week, next Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, your time uh, time zone may vary. And we'll have uh, the famous uh, DJ from K Fox, uh, C Fox, sorry, K Fox. There he goes. And uh, in the meantime, thank you very much. And once again, a big thank you out to Craig Shoemaker. He's our A lister uh, com- comedy guy from California. And hopefully, uh, Craig, please send some of your f- famous friends onto our show. Please do it. All right. See y'all. Later.